Welcome GMC family, my name is Nicole and we're so glad you're joining us. In today's service, Kevin Brown, our executive pastor, will be continuing our series, No Matter What, No Matter Where. This study of 1 Peter encourages us to always remember that no matter the circumstance or where you find yourself in that circumstance, God is there working. God's got it. If this is your first time joining us for this series, I encourage you to watch our previous sermons in this series by simply going to GrableMC.org or the Grable app. Before we join the service, I wanted to draw your attention to a couple things. If your next step in your faith journey is going all in through baptism, we'd love to join you. To start the conversation, go to GrableMC.org or the Grable app. Our next baptisms are August 13th and October 1st. Also, this week, our upper elementary kids are headed to camp. Would you consider partnering with us and praying for them this week? Maybe set a reminder on your phone or put a post-it note on the fridge to remember to pray. Pray for lives to be changed. Oh, and maybe pray for a little extra energy for the leaders. Finally, I know this life can be a little busy with all the summer activities. It's crazy how quickly it seems to be rushing by. Perhaps right now you feel rushed. Let's take a moment to pause and catch your breath. Maybe even take a deep breath and slow and slowly exhale. Ready? Let's try. Inhale. Exhale. I know in a few weeks I head back to school, and I know summer has flown by way too fast. So with those deep breaths, just ask God to open your heart and mind for what He has for you today. We're so glad you could join us, and remember, here at GMC, you are known, loved, and belong. Now let's turn it over to the worship team.
Scripture of the day is 1 Peter 2, 21 through 25. For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering. Just as Christ suffered for you, he is your example, and you must follow in his steps. He never sinned, nor ever deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor threaten revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God, who always judges fairly. 
He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds, you are healed. Once you were like sheep who wandered away, but now you have turned to your shepherd, the guardian of your souls. Come to me. 
you this morning grateful that no matter where we find ourselves this morning, whether high up on some mountain of a great week or we find ourselves in the valley, that you are a God that does not change, that your steadfast love endures forever, that you do not cast a shifting shadow. You remain the same. And Heavenly Father, no matter where we find ourselves this morning, we praise you for that. We love you for that. And we cry out again with our whole hearts that we believe in you and we trust you. I pray that you continue to move in this service this morning, that you give Ke Pastor Kevin powerful words of wisdom from you, Jesus. We love you. In your name I pray. Amen. You can have a seat. Well, hey, good morning. I'm Kevin Roth, and I currently serve as an elder here at GMC. In November, we will hold another family meeting where we will elect three new elders to fill the expiring terms of Steve Murs, Del Roth, and me. Our bylaws require that the elders be members of our church, and they're elected to a term of six years with a portion of the board being replaced every two years. Candidates must be members of Grable Missionary and possess the biblical qualifications as detailed by the Apostle Paul in Scripture. Biblical requirements for an elder can be found at 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 7, and Titus chapter 1, verses 7 to 9. Please review these passages and then submit your nomination to any of our elders or via email at elders at grablemc.org. Thanks for taking part in this process and for being a part of Grable Missionary Church. Grable, how are we doing? Woo! We're good, awesome. So I'm glad. I'm so glad you're here today. We're going to be continuing our series, no matter what, no matter where. Probably a phrase that you have heard if you've been here the last couple of weeks, over and over again. Uh, there's even been a song written about it. Someone this week handed me a shirt that says "No matter what, no matter where." I heard some rumblings that there's a couple of people getting some tattoos. I'm not saying that I endorse that, but you know, whatever unapologetically, we're going to continue to say this phrase, no matter what, no matter where around here, because we believe that's where God has us as a church in this season. So Psalm 113, 3, everywhere from the east to the west, what does it say? Praise the name of the Lord. No matter what, no matter where, that is our obligation. That's our calling. That's what we should believe as believers in Christ. And so this phrase should also make us pause for a second and maybe ask some questions. Here's a, here's a few that maybe we should be asking ourselves, who is God? Who are we to God, and what is this church thing all about? What is the body? What is the bride? No matter what, no matter where. So if you're new to Grable, welcome. Hopefully this series helps you understand the community in which we are and who we're becoming and if you're here at GMC and you've been here maybe generationally, like your parents went here, your grandparents went here, you're, you fit in that category, hopefully this sparks something new in you, no matter what, no matter where. I hope GMC as a church is known as no matter what happens in this place, we are resilient because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Not because of our own faith or what we can accomplish, but because of the blood of Christ. I want GMC to be known because no matter where God takes us, we are committed to take that next step out of obedience to Him. So, no matter what, no matter where, hopefully this clears up what this saying means to me, to us, as the body. Now I want to talk about cliches. You maybe 
when I said the word cliche, a couple came to mind, right? So a cliche is a phrase that is overused and has lost its impact because it's been overused. Maybe if you're like me, your eyes begin to roll. It's just a terrible feeling in your stomach. You just want to shut down. A few that come to mind for me is, well, there's plenty of fish in the sea. We hear that one, right? It's this cliche we say when maybe someone has gone through a breakup or they're going into a relationship, they quite, haven't quite found someone yet. It's a cliche. It can be hurtful, right? Another one is, you know, maybe it's not going the way you want it to. Maybe you're stuck on a problem. You just need to think outside the box. Okay, that's helpful. <laughs> or, uh, which is probably my favorite, there's no I in team. And kind of the cynical part of me says, well, there is a me in team. If you flip the E and the M around, there is a me. So there's these cliches. But I want to jump into First Peter today as we talk about the word honor, as we talk about the word respect. And that can be a cliche in itself. And for you, maybe your soul just pulled the emergency brake because you're like, oh no, we're going to talk about honor and respect and maybe rather than that word coming to mind, a person came to mind. Or a feeling of hurt overtook the idea of honor. Someone has hurt you. You, you might say, you don't know them. You, you, don't, you don't know what they said. You don't know what they did. You don't know what they failed to do. You don't know what they still do. You don't understand. And so the word honor, the word respect may not hold the same value as which it should. Words like honor can sometimes come off as a cliche. It's like, well, you know, I've heard that before. I've heard honor. I've heard respect. But it also can come off as hurt. It can come off triggering. But I believe that there's more depth to the word honor. There's more depth to the word respect. So we're going to be looking at 1 Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 13 through 25. And I want to remind us that this letter was written with very broad strokes. So some of the letters in the New Testament, they were written to very specific people, right? But this is written to more of a variety of listeners. It's broad strokes. Many different churches are reading and listening to, to Peter's words in 1 Peter. Peter gives the persecuted Christian a powerful reminder that they can have hope in the midst of suffering. In the midst of hurt, in the midst of triggering thoughts or words, there's hope. So the big question that we've been asking, this is week four of a nine-week series, each week we've been asking the same question, is Jesus worth it? Is Jesus worth it? The first week we talked about you can have hope. The second week, you have a calling. And then last week we talked about you're alive. Not just that you're living, not that you just have breath in your lungs, but you are alive. But now we get to kind of the thesis of what's going on. Peter begins to get to this point, and this week is all about the why. Why can we have hope? Why do we have a calling? Why can we consider ourselves alive? And that's where we pick up in today's passage. So if you want to flip to your Bible, if you want to open up you version, it should be in there, 1 Peter 2, 13 through 25. We're going to look at just the first couple verses because there's a progression. There's a, these phases in which we need to look at. So starting in verse 13, for the Lord's sake, submit to all human authority. Stop there. Again, honor, respect. It's triggering that we are to submit to all human authority, whether the king as head of the state or the officials as he appointed. For the king has sent them to punish those who do wrong and honor those who do right. It is God's will for your honorable lives should uh, silence those ignorant people who make foolish accus accusations against you. For you are free, yet you're God's slave, so don't use your freedom as an excuse to do evil. Respect everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God and respect the king. So First Peter gives the persecuted Christian a very powerful reminder that we have hope in the midst of suffering. So, if you've been around Grable, 
This is going to be different for you. If this is your first week, it's just going to feel normal. But I'm actually going to give you all of your points right now instead of the end of the sermon. Why? Because this is, like I said, the thesis of which Peter is talking about. We need to have this framework, not only as we go through this week, but also next week, you need to hold on to this framework. It's very important in understanding the remainder of the letter. So your first point, if you want to get your pen out or if you want to type this out, respect all people, or you can put honor all people. All, pantos, it's this common reference, it's this Greek idea of all people generally. It's consistent with how we should even treat non-believers. Christians should be courteous. They should be respectful to all people and to all authority. It's an inclusive word. It's, it's inclusive of every or all. This, this is even for other legitimate human authority. So maybe think about the parent and child relationship or the church officers and the members of the church, the, the authority structures in a business, educational institutions, this voluntary organization construct that we have, etc. The principle is that it's condemning men and how they treat other people in political and industrial world. Peter's trying to give us a framework in how we should respect. Not pick and choose, we are to respect and honor all people. So then he, he kind of moves on. Here's point two. Respect or honor the emperor, the king. If you want to put off in the margin, government, president, whatever, whatever it would be, senator. What, the, the human authorities, respect and honor. Peter uses the same word honor, the same Greek word honor, when he talks about the emperor. And this is very intentional. If you want to also make note of this, it's an, inten it's an intentional thing that he uses the same word. It's even mildly ironic that Peter has put the emperor on the same level as all people. Peter is affirming the obligation to honor the emperor but he's also subtly implying that the emperor was also by no means equal to God or worthy of fear due to God alone. So submit to authority implies obedience to the authority, but there's also occasions that are recorded in Scripture when God's people do not obey the authority, the government. And even God himself approves this. So I want to give an Old Testament example and a New Testament example. There's other examples, but for the sake of today, I'm going to give you one of both. So Exodus chapter 1, 17, Pharaoh gave the order that all babies that are born a boy should be put to death. If they're born a girl, let them live. But because the midwives in this time feared God, they refused to obey the king's orders. They allowed the boys to live too. So that would be an example of God's people who feared God did not listen to the authority ahead of them. There's a New Testament example, Acts 4, 18 through 20. The apostles were commanded to never speak or teach of Jesus' name. Peter, who wrote the letter that we're studying, and John kind of talk back when they're told that they're not allowed to do this. Peter, I resonate with Peter for a lot of reasons throughout. He, he makes a lot of mistakes, but also he gets it at times. This is maybe one of those times where he, he is very confident in what he's saying, but he could have maybe said it a little different. Do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? He's very upfront in what he's saying. We can't stop telling about everything we have seen and heard. So the passage goes on. They're not going to stop preaching. And the, the next session, section even says they're actually going to pray for courage and how they should begin to do that. So obey unless it commands you to sin. It goes against God's uh, word. So God's free servants, the believers, should never use their freedom to cover up or hide wrongdoing. However, freedom must result in the great joy of doing what is right. So the Roman emperor at, at the time when Peter was writing this letter was Nero. Nero reigned from about 54 AD to 68 AD roughly. Under whose persecution Peter 
himself was later put to death. So Peter's writing this. He's telling us what to do to respect all people, to respect the, the king. And yet he was put to death under this authority. God expects believers to be subject even to human authorities who are neither believers or morally upright in their standing. So respect all people, respect the, the king, the emperor, and then number three, love the family of believers. We are to love the family of believers, love the brotherhood, love the sisterhood, the, the body, the bride. That's what we're commanded to do. This in, indicates a higher obligation than just loving all people or, or honoring the king. I'm going to ruin it a little bit for you, but in chapter 5, verse 9, it says, Stand firm against them and be strong in your faith. Remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering that you are. So whether that suffering is minor or extreme, there's other people in maybe this town, state, country, world that is going through similar things. So this isn't about GMC. It isn't about Grable, Indiana, or Leo, Indiana, or Fort Wayne, the state, the country. It's about the world, the brotherhood, the sisterhood, all over the world. Do not only respect the family of God, which we should do, we should respect all people, but it goes a little bit further in what Peter is saying. Show strong and deep love for the brotherhood, the sisterhood, the family of God. This is agape love. Chapter 1, verse 22, Peter says, You were cleansed from your sins when you obeyed the truth, so now you must show sincere love to each other as brothers and sisters love each other deeply with all your heart. So we are supposed to love the bride. Not only respect, but love. So you can see what Peter is beginning to So we are supposed to be a little bit stronger. Not only are we supposed to respect them, but we're also supposed to show a deep agape kind of love for them, which may not always be attainable, but that's the goal. So then number four, fear God. Once again, one of those words that oftentimes isn't defined, it can be triggering. Uh, we think of fear and we think of maybe the boogeyman, we think of the principal, maybe there's an authority in your life that you're scared of them. That's not quite the, the language that I mean when I say fear God. First Peter 1 Peter 1.17, it's this reverent fear. And remember that the heavenly Father to whom you pray has no favorites. He will judge or reward you according to what you do, so you must live in reverent fear of him during your time here as temporary residents. So I grew up in high school. I, you know, maybe you have a favorite TV show, but for me, I, I couldn't wait till Thursday night because The Office was on. It's one of my favorite TV shows. I'm sorry if you don't like that show, but for me, uh, I resonate. There's some moments in there. And there's a regional manager in Dunder Mifflin named Michael Scott. And he talks about love and fear. One of my favorite quotes from The Office is this, would, would I rather be feared or loved? Easy, both. I want people to be afraid of how much they love me. <laughs> Although that's funny, it's comical. That is not anywhere on the same planet of what God is talking about. He doesn't want us to be afraid of how much we love him. It's not the same kind of fear. It's not to be afraid. 1 Peter 1, 18 through 21, once again going back, for you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver which loses their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God chose him as your ransom long before the world began. But now in these last days, he has been revealed for your sake. Through Christ, you have come to trust in God. And you have placed your faith and hope in God because he raised Christ from the dead and gave him great joy. That is reverent fear. It's all of, being in all of. So think of the most breathtaking place you've ever been to. For me, maybe it's Munich, Germany, when I got to see the mountains or the, the Rocky Mountains or Maybe for you, it's when your first child was born, 
And it's this awe. Like you realize that you are not the most important person on the planet. That it doesn't revolve around you. You kind of understand what it means to be in awe of. But when we're talking about God, it's even more so. It's, it's this wow. It's this, it has my whole attention. And there's very few things in our culture that gets our full attention. And for God to have our full attention, understanding that we can never fully grasp the fullness of God, that is reverent fear. It's feeling, it's the manifestation of great respect, adoration, deep love for our creator, God. And so that's what it means to fear God, at least the best way I can explain it. So then this section goes on. Once again, I'm getting all the trigger words today. We, we, we go on and we talk about slaves, servants. And so I understand before we can go on and read this, I need to begin to explain the difference between slave and servant in the first century versus the 19th century in American history. Because there's a difference. So Peter addresses the servants using the less common word, okentes, okentes. It's this idea, it's this term that's similar to doulos in the New Testament for the word servant. But okates is suggested a nuance. It's this idea of a household servant. And some will translate it to slave. Both terms are oftentimes translated to slaves uh, in many different translations, but it's a horrible degradation, in my opinion, of slaves in the 19th century of American history. The word slave is far, has a far worse connotation than it is accurate for what we're talking about today in the society in which Peter was writing to. So although there might have been mistreatment of slaves, servants, back when Peter was writing this, it must be remembered that the first century slaves were genuinely and generally well-treated. They were oftentimes managers and overseers, and they were trained members of various professions, things like doctors and nurses and teachers and musicians and very skilled artisans. There was extensive legislation that the Romans had put into place regulating the treatment of slaves. And they were also normally paid for their services of what they were providing and could also expect to eventually purchase their own freedom. So it's different than American history and what we understand. Nonetheless, these services were involuntary, and that's where they're similar. The legal status, the social standing, the opportunity for economic independence were clearly lower than the other people in the Roman society. So if we could choose a word, it would somehow be stronger than servant, but weaker than slave. That's the word we need. So it would be like semi-permanent employee without legal and economic freedom. So if someone could come up with a word for me, that would be great. Although servant comes to the closest that we have. So we're going to use the word servant, but no single English word is adequate in my opinion, perhaps because we don't have comparable institutions that exist in the modern Western world. So as we read this, have that in mind. You who are slaves, servants, must submit to your masters with all respect. Do what they tell you, not only if they are kind and reasonable, but even if they are cruel. For God's pleased when conscious of his will, you patiently endure the unjust treatment. Of course, you get no credit for being patient if you are beaten for doing wrong. But if you suffer for doing good and endure it patiently, God is pleased with you. So going back, verse 18, you who are slaves, servants, must submit to your masters with all respect. This is an encouraging word to them that they are to continue to have a mental attitude of acceptance of this legal and economic authority over them. It's the same verb that's used in verse 13 that commands submission to authorities specifically when it comes to economic realms. So the word translated respect or honor commonly means fear in the New Testament. However, it doesn't really mean that when it is related to human authorities. It doesn't seem quite as strong when it comes to fear, punishment, or harm. 
Peter seems to warn against the careless disregard of such authority. We are to honor the people that are ahead of us. Obviously, it would be easier if your master was kind and gentle, right? It would be easy to follow that master, but much more difficult if the master is overbearing and harsh. So that's why Peter is addressing them. So verse 19, for God is pleased when those conscious of his will, you patiently endure the unjust treatment. So God's very own possession, Scott preached on this last week, but you are not like that for you are a chosen people. You are royal priest, a, co- a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God for he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. That's First Peter 2, 9. There's confidence that we have as believers, followers of God, followers of Jesus, that God will ultimately right all wrongs. And it enables us as Christians to submit even to unjust authorities, unjust masters without resentment, without self-pity, without despair. Those are things that we can control. So, if you have resentment, if you have self-pity, if you have despair, that's something that, to some degree, you can control. God will right all those wrongs. So verse 20, of course, you get no credit for being patient if you're beaten for doing wrong, but if you suffer for doing good and endure it patiently, God is pleased with you. So Pastor Scott, last week, I I loved what he said here. Partial obedience is still disobedience. Partial obedience is still disobedience. At times, trusting God is not easy. And trusting what he has for us uh, in the waiting period, it goes against what is natural for us. We want to know what's next. We want things to be easy and convenient. But it's then that faith shows itself to be genuine when we can move past that. Something that God, in God's eyes is far, far more precious than gold. Chapter 1, verse 7. So then we go into our last section here. It was is the verse or the verses of the day. It's the encapsulation of the gospel. It's the good news. It's what Peter is encouraging us with. Verse 21, for God called you to do good, even if it means suffering just as Christ suffered for you. He's your example, and you must follow in his steps. He never sinned nor deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when, his, when he was insulted nor threatened revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God, who always judges fairly. He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds we are healed. Once you were like sheep who wandered away, but now you turn to your shepherd, the guardian of your souls. What a powerful word by, for, by Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2, 21 through 25. It's the gospel. It's the good news. He has encapsulated the whole thing. And may we never get tired of hearing the gospel, the good news. May we never get tired of it. May it never become a cliche to us. The fact that we have the opportunity to respond to the gospel should have our attention enough. It should give us us hope. It should give us a reason to move forward. When Peter's writing this, this letter, he's a, he's a seasoned individual. He's older, I should say. He's learned especially from his walk with Jesus in the flesh. Verse 25 makes me think that Peter had learned a few things when he was walking with Jesus. Right before they had fed the 5,000, Mark chapter 6, the language between the two passages are very similar. I want to compare them here for a second. Let's first go back and read 1 Peter 2.25. Once you were like sheep who wandered away, but now you have turned to your shepherd, the guardian of your souls. So maybe if you've been around the church, that language seems very familiar from the gospel writers. Maybe you remember the words of Mark in chapter 6, verse 34. If you don't, I want to look real quickly. Jesus saw this huge crowd 
Remember in the story, Jesus is asking people to go and rest. He was asking the disciples to go and rest, and they, the, the, these people, this crowd, kept following them. Jesus saw this huge crowd as he stepped out of the boat, and he had compassion on them because they were like, what? Sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. So this comparison of verses makes me believe that Peter understands what it means to respect all people, to love the family of believers, to truly fear God. He understands that we are to turn to the shepherd, the guardian of the soul. He might not have understood this in Mark chapter 6 because we see Peter's life and how he's kind of all over the place. And sometimes he believes something, sometimes he doesn't. We can be fickle like that. But I think he does understand in 1 Peter chapter 2. And because he's learned that, he doesn't want us to miss the kingdom, the power, the glory. And which is why he's giving us boundaries. Peter's beginning to give us a structure of what it means to honor and to respect the authorities in our lives. So, to go back to the beginning part of this conversation, you can have hope, you have a calling, you're alive, not just living, you're alive, because why? He died on the cross for our sins. Because of the resurrection, we can have awe in who God is. That's why. And it's what God has done and is going to continue to do that we can have hope, that we have a calling, that we are alive. Once again, as believers, though, we have obligations. And he has put those very clearly to us and will continue to do so throughout the letter, that we are to respect all people, respect, respect the emperor, that we are to love the family of believers and fear God. Christians have obligations not only to the state, to the government, sure, but the obligations to God and to the family of believers are much, much higher. Let's pray. Jesus, your word in 1 Thessalonians says this, see that no one pays back evil for evil, but always try to do good to each other and to all people. In the light of what we talked about today, may we see this as true. May we do good by honoring and respecting all people. Give us the depth of your love for the family of believers. May we be in awe of who you are, have a reverent fear, and, have, and that you would have our full attention. Jesus, may we see the kingdom and the power and the glory is all yours and that you have graciously invited us into that to partner with you. And so no matter what is in front of us and no matter where we find ourselves, may we seek your guidance because of your death and resurrection. Thanks for loving us. Thanks for being our God. Thanks that we just get to come and worship you. We pray all these things in your precious name. Amen. Would you stand? Let's sing this together. Lord, I come and I confess bowing here I find my rest and without you Your grace is more with grace.
Well, you, you can keep standing. We're going to pray in just a minute. But as always, if you feel the Spirit moving you to take a next step, would you please, please stop at guest services. We would love to walk you through whatever the Spirit is, is speaking to you because we don't do this life alone. So please stop at guest services. We would love to walk you through uh, what that looks like. And it's no secret, if you followed us through the summer, you know that God has moved in incredible ways through the lives of teenagers and kids and there's been so many first-time commitments, spiritual breakthroughs, all that stuff happening in the summer, and God's not done working yet. 
Tomorrow afternoon, we have Camp Blast leaving for the week. And so real quick, I just want to pray for them before we leave. So if you can, can you just reach out your hands as we pray for the kiddos? Father, we love you. We're so grateful for your word and for your spirit and how it works in our lives. And uh, Father, just this moment, we pray for Camp Blast. We pray for Jana. We pray for Molly. We pray for the leaders that are going. We pray for a, a spirit of, of protection over the camp, over them. Would you give them strength, wisdom, and discernment, Father, as they go and they minister to these kids. I pray this week that these kids, man, just draw near to you, Father. They look to you, and they look back 10, 20 years from now knowing, man, I loved Camp Blast, and I loved getting to know the Lord. I pray that by the end of this week, they look more like you, Jesus, than they did when they arrived. Father, we're so excited to see how you're going to show up this week. We love you. We commit this camp to you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's go, and let's be the church. Have a great week.